Last week, more than 40,000 people signed a petition to keep this man, Dariush Velazada, out of Canada. Velazada, that sounds Persian. Why? Is he a terrorist from Iran or something? Why should we keep him out of our free country? What crimes has he committed? Montreal's mayor, Denis Coderre, jumped on the bandwagon, saying Velazada isn't welcome in his city. Take a look. Soon Toronto's chattiest city councillor, Norm Kelly, tweeted, urging all venue locations in Toronto to deny Rouge V the opportunity to use their space. He and his views are not welcome in Toronto, unquote. Immediately, Mayor John Tory joined in too, saying this man, quote, doesn't reflect the values of Toronto and his statements about women are demeaning and unacceptable. Now, the CBC asked Kelly the same question I'm asking now. What had this would-be criminal said or done? He's written 14 books, apparently, all self-published, by the way. So uh, I haven't had access directly to his words. So Kelly doesn't know, hasn't bothered to find out, but someone on the Internet told him he was a bad man? Yeah, the city is in the safest of hands. Okay, well, let's do the work the others won't. Who is this Darius Velizade? And what crimes has he committed, or will he commit? Well, actually none so far. I mean, Velizadeh, who goes by the nickname Roosh, is indeed of Persian and Turkish ethnicity, but he's an American. He says he's never been charged with a crime, let alone convicted of anything. That petition did accuse him of planning to commit a crime, but the crime they warned about was the thought crime of disagreeing with radical feminism. See, Rouge is a men's rights activist, a meninist, if you will. He started out a decade ago as a pickup artist, someone who used to have terrible luck with women, but he kept going to bars trying to improve his game, as he called it, getting to the point where he had some success. And then he started to write about it as a self-help guide for men with no luck with women. He wrote a blog, later he wrote books. At first he was an anonymous guy, and then his identity was revealed. But he continued, naturally this drew the ire of women who found him manipulative, which he plainly admits to being. That's the thing about Roosh is he's strikingly candid. I think that's why he's so hated. He calls it a game and he says he's a player and so he strips through the veneer of politeness or political correctness that usually covers over the battle of the sexes. I don't think feminists mind so much that he admits he's manipulative. I think what bothers feminists about him more is how he reveals them and feminism sexual manipulation techniques. I've actually never seen a cultural conservative get worked up about Roosh, though he is promiscuous. He doesn't particularly offend cultural conservatives, religious conservatives, Christian conservatives, because he's really no more profligate than any other pro-sex personality in the age of dating and hookup apps like Tinder and Snapchat and sexting and ubiquitous pornography and naked pride parades. I mean, he upsets the normally promiscuous left because his success is based on cracking their code. He identifies modern feminism's flaws and uses that to get lots of dates. He's discovered that women being promiscuous allows men to be promiscuous. A man like Roosh couldn't exist if dozens, hundreds of liberated women didn't allow it. There are two halves of the same zipper. Feminism promises women easy sex, but that means easy sex for men too. Roosh points that out, which undermines the claim that feminism empowers or elevates women. Uh, when the birth control pill debuted in the 60s, it was called part of women's liberation, women's lib. Sure it was. But it also meant men's liberation because it meant men could have sex without consequences too. They didn't have to make commitments. They didn't have to be loyal or stick around and keep promises. Men just didn't have to work as hard to please women or to behave as well. They certainly didn't have to propose marriage. Over the years, Roosh has developed a worldview, a political philosophy, based on his hundreds of observations of how women behave towards men and the differences by countries. He notes the differences in women in places like Toronto versus, say, in Poland and Ukraine, and the difference is political feminism. If you read Roosh's critics, he's a rapist, or at least a would-be rapist, or at least someone who promotes rape culture. It's tough to take political feminists seriously on this when they systematically ignore real rape cultures like the Islamic State 
and it's rape slavery and much of the Muslim world. And when feminists promote political rape hoaxes in the U.S., like the lie on the cover of the Rolling Stone magazine about that university rape, Western feminism is a political campaign whose modern battlefronts are trivial things like man-spreading when men sit with their legs open on subways or complaining when young women get uh, compliments as they walk down on the street, uh, walk down the street from strangers. But I checked out the most shocking charge against Roosh, uh, the most widely reported claim against him that was also in that petition that Roosh believes rape should be legalized. That's the accusation. I read his entire column on that subject, and it was clearly an outrageous satire in the spirit of Jonathan Swift's modest proposal to eat the poor. It was a lament that he observed that so many young women get drunk and do drugs in the company of strange men they hardly know, and that no one was teaching these young women to be careful or even to value their own modesty. A real feminist in the old-fashioned sense of that word would have agreed with Roosh's point. It would have been sad at how women today have desensitized themselves to promiscuity and have devalued their own sexuality and actually put themselves at real risk of rape. But modern social justice warriors thought this satire was proof that Roosh was a criminal. And it was proof enough for two mayors and a city councillor who obviously didn't even bother to read it. Look, I don't agree with everything Roosh says and certainly not all that he does. And thankfully, his descriptions of modern women, it's not universally true, probably not even true in the main. Most women are not the promiscuous drunks he describes. If he looked for women at a church picnic instead of at a bar, he'd probably see a whole different world. But what he says is true enough about our dominant popular culture, the culture on TV and online and in Hollywood, the cool people. I thought I would do what no other Canadian reporter has done. Instead of screaming at Roosh, instead of proving what a white knight I am for women rushing in to save damsels from distress, you know, I thought I'd engage in a conversation with them. I don't have a lot in common with them in my personal life, but I do know what it's like to be censored by left-wing extremists. That was enough to start. Here's my conversation with a controversial man. Let me know what you think of the interview afterwards in the comments below. I'm not going to ask you exactly where you're located because Good. I've been watching. I won't tell you. Yeah, fair enough. I've been watching uh, with great curiosity on social media and on your own websites. You are literally being hunted by a pack of feminist social justice warriors who are stalking you in person, like literally in person. I've never seen anything like it. You know, uh, and what, what has actually happened is that the media here, led by the CBC, Bell Media, and CTV, they published a lot of lies about me that turned me, in, that turned me into someone I'm not, into a monster who rapes children and everything. And so they've gotten this mob frothed up and they've incited this mob to assault me. So we have to see where does this anger come from? And the anger comes from the state-owned media here or the privately owned. And they've gotten these bunch of naive kids here really angry at nothing, got them angry at a planned speech I have, which I've already done in Germany, England, the USA, a speech that is essentially a men's happy hour. A men's happy hour where a group of men can talk about life, self-improvement, business, women, lifting. And they've gotten over 40,000 people online and people here in Canada outside angry at me and trying to censor me, trying to defame me. They are lying about who I am and what I have done, accusing me of threatening them, which I have not. And now they have settled, because they can't win with the truth, they have settled to actual violence. And just the other day, I went to the police station to file charges against a woman who not only attacked me, but spread the address I was staying in Montreal to incite further violence. Mm -hmm. So this is a serious deal. And the establishment in Canada, starting with the mayor and also some ministers, they don't care. In fact, they're encouraging this. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw the video. I mean, the assault wasn't vicious. Someone threw some beer at you. But then a pack sort of chased you back to the hotel and tried to enter with you. 
uh, this same pack caused one of the venues you were to speak at to cancel your contract, and they were so desperate to find out where you were to, to shut you down. I saw what you did is you gave out disinformation that you would be speaking here or there, and they were literally running through the city like some sort of feminist wild goose chase while you and your... Uh, how many people in the end came to listen to you speak? You know, Montreal, I don't have a lot of fans here, actually. So this event was only planned for about 40 guys. So about 35 showed up. And, I mean, the amount of energy and time that went to stop a little speech is uh, an overreaction that I've never seen before. Because what they had, they had two goals. They actually wanted to stop me from coming into Canada. So this got started last week. And they uh, got a petition up to 40,000 people. They lobbied. They called the Canadian border, the, the border patrol. They called any authority figure that they could. But what they didn't know is that while this was at its height, I was already here. So they were wasting their time while I knew it. So I didn't say it. I didn't say that I was here. And their second goal was to cancel the speech. So they actually found out what the first venue was. I don't know how, but it leaked out. And they did the victory lab. They, they said, yes, we shut them down. But I wasn't ready to give up. I was ready to do this speech at all costs. So I found another venue, hit it, and then used a series of operations as if it was a war to not only hide it, but also to spread disinformation. I mean, I had them run in on Saturday to the wrong hotels and they were fighting amongst each other. So in the two goals that they had to keep me out and to shut me down, they failed. So I wanted, you know, I hope I can show everyone that if you stand up, you can stop this raging mob. All it takes is a group of people to say, no, we're not going to be censored. We're not going to let them use lies to stop us from giving a legal speech. Now, we're going to get into the substance of your speech and, uh, and why these so-called social justice warriors, these, these extremist feminists hate you so much. We will talk about the substance because I think most of our viewers who are unfamiliar with you might be saying, well, what's this all about? So a fellow, was, they were trying to keep him out. They were trying to hound him and he fought back and succeeded. But what is the spark? We'll get to that in a moment. Let me just ask you, um, I read the petition to keep you out of the country. Uh, it said you were spreading hate speech and, and uh, calling for violence and you had been denounced by the left-wing Southern Poverty Law Center. Let me ask you, either coming into Canada or once you were here and when you went to the police in Montreal to file charges against the woman who assaulted you, at any time did any official in Canada actually take steps to affect any form of censorship against you? Has any bureaucrat or any government agent whatsoever impeded your free speech? Has there been a legal action by the police or a government representative to arrest me? N no, they've only made statements. Uh, the mayor, like the mayor did, I think the minister of justice also. Right, those are politicians. So a couple yeah, of politicians so blow hearts. Has there been a specific action to stop me? No. And the reason is because there's nothing illegal or wrong that I am doing. If you read the work I do, it fits completely within the realm of right. legal, legal speech. I haven't been accused of a crime. I don't, I've never been arrested. I mean, I am in, within completely the legal realm. And so this is why, I don't know if they looked into it, see if they could stop yeah. me. But so far, no. So it's mostly the media, and they really got this mob yeah. to get angry. And so they've um, tried to use them. They've tried to use this, these naive kids to stop me when the authorities, in terms of the police, decided not to. Yeah, you know, I, I have some experience with so-called hate speech and, and censorship in Canada myself. I'm going to disagree with you just from my own experience and observation. I don't think these were naive kids. I think these are professional activists. These are uh, students who are not in school to learn. These are late 20s, early 30s, permanent students. Montreal in particular has a perpetual protest class who this week are on about you, next week will be on some other matter. So I don't think that they're naive kids. And I think it was sort of reverse. I think the mayor 
jumped on the bandwagon. He saw 30, 40,000 signatures. He saw a media that was sympathetic. So he said, oh, let me just uh, buff up my social justice warrior credentials. I think it was that way. But let's get into who you are. I, I have read some of your work on your website. It's called Return of Kings. Am I right? Yes. And, and I haven't gone deep into the subject matter that first made you famous. I mean, uh, would you take exception to being characterized as a pickup artist? I don't think it's up to me to decide what people should call me or not. So whatever label people want to use, that's fine. But did I start with that? Yes, back in Okay, and, th and that's the thing. I mean, basically you wrote a dating guide for the yeah. modern man, how to navigate in our strange world where old rules of courtship don't apply, where old rules of masculinity and femininity don't apply, and where what maybe our fathers did to, to find a life mate, to invest in a particular woman, the traditional courtship, those rules don't apply. You, you took a very cold-blooded view of that and came up with what you call game, basically gaming out scenarios to how to date women in a world where, where the old rules don't apply. Would you say that's a fair summary of what you did? You know, what I did was take the most logical approach to solving a problem that almost all men have is to find a sexually attractive woman to have sex with. So I looked at it from a logical point of view. I was a scientist before I studied microbiology. And I, I kind of applied the tactics of making a hypothesis and observation and trying different experiments to see what would work, what would help me increase my success. And I did that for many years, starting in around 2001. And I wrote book after book on how I did it. And other guys, they liked the work that I did, so they bought it and my audience grew more and more. But yeah, what the way I started was to spread tips on teaching men to spread their seed to as many women as they possibly can just to have fun. And so this is what I did for a long time. But as a man gets older, he goes through another phase. He doesn't want to sow his royal oats for the rest of his life. So he has his fun when he's a little bit younger. And so for me, I've started to ease out of that. So when people call me a pickup artist, I don't mind because right away that underestimates what I'm doing now. So they think I'm just some kind of hornball that goes out in the club every night mm -hmm. when really now we're working on more serious issues. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think various people would find what you do objectionable. There would be a moral or Christian or religious objection to promiscuity uh, or even to the kind of, um, uh, I'm not going to say one night stand courtship approach, but there would be that moralistic criticism. But it seems to me that the chief opponents of what you were doing are not, let's call them prudish conservatives but rather feminist leftists who say, oh, he has cracked the code. Is it true to say that your meninist approach would have no demand if it weren't for the feminist challenge that was posed first? What game is, is a response to women no longer seeking a husband and no longer wanting to be a wife and mother, no longer wanting to settle down with a good man. It is a response to a culture that is now enabling and encouraging them to, when they're young, have as much fun as they want, sleep with all the exciting men that they can find while pursuing money, career, and jobs, and entertainment. So that's what game is. It's like, well, if a woman doesn't want a good man anymore, if she doesn't want a husband and kids anymore, when she's in the prime of her physical life at 21, 22, what does she want? Well, she wants sex, casual sex, meaningless sex, shallow sex with exciting men. So we have to account for that. And the response that we give in turn is how to be the men that the modern woman who primarily seeks entertainment, what she wants in a man. And look, I look back to some of the things I did when I was young with the one night stands and the notches and things such as that. And I, I think, wow, that was a shallow way to live. But they say that the palace of wisdom goes through the road of excess. I exceeded what my sexual need was in the most shallow way I could. So that has allowed me to have the wisdom now to find out where the line is and what is healthy. 
for both women and men. You know, I, I've read some of your columns and it seems to me, and sometimes you talk about men wearing the clown face or putting on an act. It almost seems to me like a lament. Uh, now, maybe it's just covering up uh, the, the hedonistic joys of promiscuity, but it seems to me that you almost lament having to find this scheming, gaming way to connect with a woman. You've written about Eastern European countries like Poland and Ukraine, places where this, that uh, are, are not as feminized uh, in, the, in the political sense as the West, and you, you say you find those places more appealing. Is that because they're sort of maybe 40 years ago, 50 years ago in their dating morality? You know, I look back to what my dad had to do to get my mom. All he had to do was have a job and take a shower every day. He could be himself completely. He didn't have to be entertaining, exciting. He didn't have to be bad. He didn't have to be a DJ with six pack abs. So all he had to do was be a good man and it worked. But now if you try to be a good man, you won't even get laid. You won't even get a date because women have been encouraged to chase after this really narrow ideal of what an attractive man is. And am I sad that I, when I have to interact with a woman and have some kind of intimacy with her, start a relationship with her, I have to put a clown mask and be this entertaining ideal that she now wants. Yes. Why can't I just be myself? Why can't I be a man that has character, honor, that is honest, that wants to treat his woman good, that wants to treat his family good? Why can't I just be a normal man? Why do I have to make all these jokes and dance up and down? Why do I have to pretend that my life is so exciting and I've done this exciting thing so maybe she thinks I'm, my status is actually high? And look, I'm not saying that I deserve a girl who's a 10 out of 10, but if I worked on myself, my resources are fine and I am ready to give value, I see no reason why I should have to move heaven and earth and spend a thousand hours mastering the art of game just to get a girl who is kind of cute, you know, because men of the past, they did not. So when I travel to Eastern Europe, where survival is not as easy there, there you can't be a student that's majoring in sociology or women's studies and have a comfortable life like they can here. So they actually look to men with good values and who has a good job, who in a partnership, they can have a good life together. So in that case, I don't have to dance as much there. I don't have to be more entertaining than her smartphone, which is loaded with Instagram and Facebook and so on. So there I can just say who I am, be myself, and hope that a natural connection happens. Mm. But in the US, a natural connection will not happen unless you really figure out how to scratch the itch of what these modern women want. You know, I want to I want to go back. There's a concept in Canada. I don't know if it's spread to the states called the slut walk, where girls are encouraged to dress as slutty as possible and and they shout at anyone, "How dare you criticize that? That's proof of a rape culture." It's a, it's a bizarre blurring of what a woman ought to be, what a woman should want to be, what the threats to a woman are, because of course these women aren't raped, thank God, at the, at the slut walks. And, and yet they're, it's, it's just such a confusing ball of wisdom that young girls are told this is the way to be a feminist. I think that the women's movement has undermined women more than any game movement in reaction. What do you think? You know, I think that sheep need to follow a shepherd. And now women are being not followed by a shepherd who cares for them. They're being led astray by the wolves. Women are now being taught to go against their natural roles, feminine, nurturing, motherly roles, to become a beast of something where they mutilate themselves, they become masculine, they color their hair green and red, they argue with men, they assault men, you know, and they try to attack men. They push these false ideas like sexism and rape culture, and they show their bodies in public half naked, and at the same time say, don't objectify me. You know, right now we have the most irrational, 
illogical breed of women. They are lost. They are just completely lost. These women, if we roll back the clock, they would have been pleasant mothers, wives. They would have taken care of a nice home. And instead, they're tattooing their body, mutilating themselves, sleeping with a lot of men, becoming slaves to corporate uh, electronics, smartphones, Netflix, Internet. And it's sad. And you have to ask yourself, who pays for what this for what is actually happening Mm -hmm. and who benefits? I can tell you now the women don't benefit and the men don't. It's the people who are selling things to them that are actually having a good time now. So what we're we're actually seeing is the womanly role has been destroyed completely in order to turn them into these corporate slaves that are dependent on the government and dependent on corporations to give them what they feel is happy, what would make them happy. It's almost like pro-choice isn't even choice anymore. You must live a certain extremist feminist stereotype or you're a failure. Now, I don't want to come across as misogynistic. I don't want to come across as saying no to any women's choices. But it seems like the choices being pushed on young women today are, there's not a lot of diversity there. You say the word homemaker, and there's a derision. You know, the Cosmopolitan uh, magazine readers would spit at that word. What do you think of that? Well, then I would have to ask you, where is the propaganda coming from that starting when a a girl is young in school is only giving her one message? And that message is men will enslave you work in a corporation. That's basically the sole message that women starting when their kids are getting. And so I need to ask you, where does that come from? Do you think it's an accident that now women are being encouraged in mass into the labor force? and that they're being encouraged to distrust men, that men are the source of their problems and trying to hold them down from having a paper pushing job in a crappy office? Where does that come from? There, I believe, is it's coming from the top down. They have found out that a good way to lower the price of labor, to control everyone, is to make sure women work to destroy the family unit. This is as clear as day. If you look at all the policies coming out of the left, starting with abortion, birth control for everyone, morning after pill, gay marriage, all this stuff, it has the same effect to kill the family unit. And it's working great. When you have a woman and man, they can't even have sex anymore without the man being in fear that he's going to go to jail. That's what they want. They, They want women and men to not be dependent on each other, on their own family and tribe. They want them to be dependent on the government, to follow marching orders from the establishment. Do what you're told. Read in the CBC what they're saying about this horrible misogynist man. He is coming. Get angry at him. Attack him. Attack other men who share those types of views. Breed distrust between the family unit. Destroy them. And it's going to be very easy to control a population where that has no social fabric. Huh. And at the same time, you import millions of immigrants to mix it up to make sure now you have a huge population that is lost, that need, that is looking for the new hot app to follow. And you can rule over them very easily and they will never rise up and fight against you. I tell you, the strangest mix, Roosh. I mean, on the one hand, you're a promiscuous man. On the other hand, you sound like a conservative uh, Bible thumper. I've, I've never seen such a mix of ideas. Uh, we've been very generous with your time. I, I haven't touched on all the controversies because there were specific things uh, thrown at you by these critics who were literally hunting the streets of Montreal for you. I don't want to take time indulging those accusations, but let me ask you this. I, I have seen various... Uh, hateful things and critical things uh, about you. You hinted at it before that maybe you've mellowed a bit after 15 years on this circuit. Is there anything you could say to yourself back in 2001 if you could send a message backwards in time? Uh, is, uh, do you regret anything you've said or done? Do you regret the, 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 uh, the journey you've been on? Do you regret some of the things you've said? No, I don't, because everything that I did at that time, in my mind, was right at, at, at the time. It was part of my own journey of finding the path to truth and enlightenment that I 
hope to achieve now. So when I was young, honestly, I just wanted to get laid. That's it. I just wanted to have sex. And so my entire work back then was only that. What I didn't know is that just trying to get laid is the gateway, is the gateway drug to finding about all these other things, how women and men are, how the establishment is, how government is, how the culture is, how the West is. It ties into everything. Learning how women really are is the gateway to learning how the world is. Now you're coming to Toronto. You're coming to Toronto when next weekend, is that right? Yes. And uh, obviously the location I imagine will be kept confidential until the last minute for the same reasons. How can people who are interested in going to your event, uh, how can they find out more? Well, we, I don't want to open the list up because I'm scared that a mold is actually going to get in. So I'm requiring men to send me an email to kind of show that they're not part of the, of, of the enemy. But uh, it's going to be small. I mean, this was originally a plan for 50, 60 guys. So I'm not going to all of a sudden make it larger. So yeah. what I have for Saturday is a meeting for about 50 guys. And we are ready to figure out how to make it work. We are ready for them, whatever they come at, come at us with. In, in, in Montreal, we showed them that we will not stand down. We will not apologize for what we are doing because it is legal and we will fight back. So if the people in Toronto want to stop me, they need to understand what they're going up against. Yeah. Rouge Feliz today, thanks so much for taking the time with us today. You've been very generous with your time. Sorry, Viewers, what do you think? Was I too easy on the guy or was it a fascinating conversation? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Rouge, thanks again, everybody. You're watching the Rebel.media.